Um, I think one of the things I'm really excited about is a very recent thing and in, in that it's come to market really recently. It's been in the works for about five years and it's something called a liquid biopsy. Um, and the reason this is interesting is that when you think about the sort of major chronic diseases, which is the diseases of atherosclerosis, so heart disease, stroke, uh, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease, we don't have a lot of great tools at detecting cancer early. Uh, so cancer screening is a somewhat controversial topic. Most people are probably familiar with things like mammograms, colonoscopies, and PSA testing. Um, there are two or three others that um, rise to the level of having evidence to suggest that we do them, for example, pap smears. Um, but when it comes to some of the really bad actors of cancer, we don't really have great screening tools. And so what a liquid biopsy does is it draws a sample of blood and through that tries to predict whether or not you have cancer cells in your body and tries to do so, of course, when you have very, very few of them, because the evidence is overwhelming that all things being equal, a cancer when caught early at an early stage is imminently more curable than a cancer caught at a later stage. And probably the most compelling um, explanation for that is that the longer a cancer gets to fester in your body, the more chance it has to develop mutations. And the more mutations it generates, the more difficult it is to target later on. So there are a number of companies that have been doing this, but to me, the most interesting by far is a company called Grail um, because of the method that they've gone about doing this. And the method is using something called cell-free DNA as opposed to tumor DNA. And just for those listening, Grail is in holy grail. The exactly. <laughs> Coming out big. Um, as a little side note, Grail was recently acquired by another company called Illumina, Illumina being the largest company that does DNA sequencing. And a very interesting note is the FTC has sued Illumina uh, for antitrust violations in this acquisition, which if you understand the science of it, and we don't have to get into it in great detail, um, is literally the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So that the FTC has done this, in my opinion, is actually a tragedy because it is actually going to cost um, lives. It's going to cost tens of thousands of lives in delay if this um, acquisition does not go through because Illumina has the power to scale this up like no other company would. Putting that aside for a moment, um, what is what is cell-free DNA? Because that's really at the heart of this technology. Say that one more time. What is cell-free DNA? Cell-free like DNA. C-E-L-L -L hyphen yep. free. Yeah, as in DNA that's not in a cell. So most of the DNA in your body is contained within cells. Um, but when a cell breaks down, or sometimes even when cells spontaneously, like red blood cells, or actually typically monocytes, white blood cells, make DNA and then spontaneously like release it from them, you can capture these small amounts of cell-free DNA. So if you draw somebody's blood, whether or not they have cancer or not, they're gonna have a certain amount of this cell-free DNA floating around. You have signatures on DNA called methylations. A methyl group is just a carbon with three hydrogens on it. It's one of the most basic building blocks of organic chemistry. And as DNA acquires these signatures, so remember DNA is made up of these four nucleotides, when they start binding these little methyl That's groups. That's the ACTG. Exactly, mm -hmm. ACTG. As they start acquiring these methyl groups, that tells a bit of a story. And even though there's not a lot of cell-free DNA, um, when you look at it, the best analogy, and one of my analysts actually came up with this analogy, is it's sort of like looking at, you know, meteor fragments that would land in the desert and being able to understand what type of an asteroid they came from. Mm -hmm. So even though the asteroid is enormous and it shed like big ch chunks of meteor down to Earth, and by the time they actually hit the Earth, they're just small rocks, a chemical analysis of that would give you a greater idea where it came from. So this type of test can actually de detect up to 50 different types of cancers. There are certain ones that it's not very good at detecting, such as prostate cancer, um, which is not bad because we have other tools that are so good at detecting prostate cancer. Um, but when you do this blood test, you basically get a readout which says no cancer detected or the following have been detected. And it does this with about a 50% sensitivity and about a 97 to 99% specificity. Now to explain what that means in context requires a little bit of math and it's worth going into. So sensitivity is the probability that a cancer is truly there if detected by the test. 
and specificity is, a prob is the probability that the cancer is not there if not detected by the test. So sensitivity speaks to true positives and specificity speaks to true negatives. Now at first, 50% sensitivity doesn't sound that good, but you have to remember it depends on what we call the pretest probability is. So pretest probability says, what is the probability that you have cancer before I test you? And that's a function of many things. It's a function of the prevalence of that cancer. It's a, it's a function of your age. It's a function of other behaviors. So for example, two people being otherwise identical, except one being a smoker and one not being a smoker are gonna have very different pretest probabilities. But when you start to think about, <clears throat> for example, you, what's your pretest probability of having pancreatic cancer? It's quite low. Fortunately, even though pancreatic cancer is one of the most lethal cancers out there. So in a low probability environment, a modest sensitivity of 50% and a very high uh, specificity produces incredible what we call positive and negative predictive value. So what do those things mean? So positive predictive value, as it sounds, means what's the probability that if you get a positive test, you truly have cancer, a negative predictive value is of course, if you have a negative test, what's the probability it's negative? These numbers end up being well north of 90%. In fact, the negative predictive value is about 99.7%. The positive predictive value is in the ballpark of about 97%. So these are really exciting tests, especially when you pair them with some of the other things that we do in our practice, such as relying on a very special type of MRI technology that uses something called diffusion-weighted imaging, that adds sort of a functional dimension to MRI. Quick note there, people can, if they really want to deep dive into that subject matter, you have a guest on your podcast, and I've, I've listened to this episode, it get, does get quite technical, but That's right. what is the guest name for people who want to, want to search? Raj, R-A-J, uh, and how do you spell his last name? A-T-T-R-A-A-W-A-L. Of course, I can't spell in my head, but if you just search Raj, MRI, it'll, it'll pop up. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, yes, that's, that's an episode we usually make our patients listen to before they go and get one of those MRIs. So they understand it. Follow up to that un, unrelated, but, uh, related to grail. What is it that happened or what technology was developed that suddenly made this possible where it was not possible before or what realization, why did this suddenly come to fruition? Or, it, or, or only now become available? It, I, I think the major insight, and I will be doing a podcast on this, but I need to wait until this FTC issue is resolved a little bit because the person that I really want to interview for the podcast, who is one of the people that had the biggest hand in developing this, um, is actually now the chief scientific officer at Illumina. And so for him to be able to speak about it, obviously it would need to make sense that Illumina actually owns the technology again. I would say, and this might change as I get deeper into understanding their journey, I think it was the realization that tumor, that tumor DNA was not the place to go. So at the outset of this process, people didn't know what to look for. Would you look for RNA of tumors? Because RNA is the, you know, it's the template that's telling you to make the protein. And that didn't really pan out because RNA is so unstable by itself. So then pivoting to DNA, the logical choice was, well, let's look for the tumor DNA. You know, if you have pancreatic cancer and we can find the DNA of a pancreatic cancer cell, that would be a good place to start. But you're, you have to be looking for cell-free DNA by definition when you're doing a liquid biopsy because you're not going to sample the organ. And it turns out that tumor DNA represents about 0.1% of cell-free DNA. So I think the big aha for Grail was realizing, no, let's look at cell-free DNA, which is much more abundant, but instead look at the methylation patterns and then specifically figure out what those methylation patterns were. So that was the real puzzle. Yeah, the, the forensic science. Yep. That's very cool. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, I interrupted a train of thought that uh, had more to say about Grail. Do you want to, to say more about Grail or do you want to hop to another? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I just think that this is, you know, I, I'm... I have been waiting for this, like I said, for five years, um, because I think that I'm just less bullish on the idea that we're going to quote unquote cure cancer, right? If you put cancer in perspective, the overall survival for people with metastatic cancer has improved about 5% in 50 years. 
And virtually all of that improvement has come with a handful of very specific types of cancers. Um, so for example, something called the GI stromal tumor, um, and a certain type of testicular cancer for which there's been like, you know, very specific behaviors of these that have rendered them quite sensitive to, to certain chemotherapies. But when it comes to, you know, lung cancer, when it comes to pancreatic cancer, when it comes to colon cancer, breast cancer, once you don't catch it early, you're sort of in the same situation you were in, in about 1970. Uh, and that's, that's pretty depressing when you consider how much progress has been made in cardiovascular disease since that time. So I think the answer in how do you live longer with respect to cancer is prevention, is prevention first. And, well, it, it's both, right? It's so what can we do to prevent cancer and not smoking and being metabolically healthy are hands down the two biggest things that you can do. And then the next step is how aggressively can you screen and stack different levels of screening technologies on top of each other so that you know, the way we kind of describe it to patients is you want to think of like the Swiss cheese approach, right? You want to be able to stack a whole bunch of things on top of themselves so that you just get only one pencil can fit through. Yeah. Each, each method or technology in and of itself having gaps, but That's right. when you lay them on top of each other, hopefully the, 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 the remaining gaps are sort of allowable, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. And, yeah. and it's exactly that. It's basically how do you use multiple technologies to cover the blind spots of others? I'm excited about Grail also because it seems like, especially if scaled through Illumina, the ability to have Grail widely distributed uh, makes it just by definition more available, at least as one tool compared to, say, the MRI that we were referring to right. earlier which would appear to be site specific. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, MRI is going to be far less scalable. Um, and, the, and, and frankly, far more of a hassle. I mean, if you've, I don't know if you've ever had, well, you haven't had one yet. We got to get you up there. Yeah, I've had <laughs> for better and for worse, probably quite a few MRIs, uh, not always in ideal circumstances, yeah. but this particular MRI, not yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's like, how do you drive the cost down? How do you improve the technology? How do you make the algorithm better and better and better? Because it is under under all of this is a huge engine of machine learning mm. that makes it better over time.